In this lecture, we're going to be examining the five mechanisms of evolution, which are natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, mutations, and finally non-random mating. So let's look at each one sequentially. First, natural selection. So how did natural selection come about? Well, of course, this is the idea of Charles Darwin. And we also should remember that um, Malth, uh, Wallace excuse me, also came up with this idea, independent of Charles Darwin. But both of them basically relied upon four observations that came together to bring them to the conclusion of natural selection. The first observation was that in populations, members of populations um, the individuals of populations have characteristics and they vary in these characteristics. So it, this example shows all of these snails here of the same species and they all look a little bit different. And this is the same for any population. Populations vary even if it's just a little bit. Number two, traits that are that vary right among these organisms are inherited from the parents to the offspring now not every single characteristic is inherited right like if we eat too much we maybe get a, a gut on us and maybe that's not a, a part of our genetics and so it doesn't get passed on but for the most part when we're looking at natural populations the characteristics that we've seen are passed on from parents to offspring. And there's actually ways of determining whether or not something is passed on or how much of a characteristic is due to the genetics and how much is due to, to environmental factors. But Darwin saw that the majority of the characteristics, and he um, proposed and assumed that the majority of the characteristics are inherited from parents to offspring. Number three, it, uh, the third observation was that um, species, when they reproduce, they produce more offspring than the current um, environment can support, right? I mean, there's just not enough resources to go around, not enough food to go around, not enough space to go around, not enough places to put your put waste. There's all of these problems with, with resources, and there's just a lack of resources for the number of offspring that are produced. And this is true for any organism. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about elephants or whether we're talking about something like aphids. Now, for aphids, of course, their generation time is much more quickly than something like elephants. And so it would really only take a matter of, you know, a few years for if every single aphid from one aphid, right, lived and then survived and reproduced and lived and survived and reproduced. If every single one survived and never none of them ever died, it would only take a few years for this entire earth to be overrun with aphids, right? Uh, if you do the same thought exercise with something like bacteria, it would only take a couple weeks for the entire earth to be overrun with bacteria. So clearly, um, the environment cannot support every single offspring. Some offspring are going to die. Number four. Um, if you take into account the three previous observations, then you are required to see that organisms then struggle to survive. And those that are best at, at, at surviving are able to then live long enough to then reproduce and, and have offspring, and therefore pass on their characteristics that they happen to have to their offspring. So there is a struggle to survive, you know, <laughs> like this, this uh, seal here trying to get away from this white shark and you know you can think about something like all of these turtles. Not all these turtles are going to survive. Some of them are going to get eaten before they even get in the water. Some of them are going to get in the water and going to get eaten immediately. And only a small percentage of all of these turtles is going to make it to live long enough to become an adult to then come back to these same shores, reproduce, and and uh, have their genes be carried on in through time. So if you put all four of those observations together, variation, inheritance, the overproduction of offspring, and that there is a struggle, if you put all of that together, then Charles Darwin said you have unequal reproductive success, right? Some organisms just happen to have the variations that allow them to survive better than other organisms, other, I'm um, sorry, other individuals of the same species, right? And so therefore they struggle, they survive better, and they survive until reproduction, and then when they reproduce, they pass those particular characteristics and variations that allowed them to survive onto their offspring. And if you do that over generation, over generation, over generation, 
you get a little bit of change and the offspring get more and the offspring are always better adapted to the parents environment um, as, as this happens. Now this unequal reproductive success then that some individuals in a population are just better suited to survive than others is called natural selection because nature selects the individuals that are not as well suited in a particular environment. They have less of a chance of surviving and therefore they do not survive. And those that are just a little bit better suited in any particular environment tend to survive and therefore nature selects them to, um, to live and then therefore reproduce. So that's why it's called natural selection. Now the product of natural selection is adaptation. As this happens over generations, a population becomes more and more adapted to any particular environment. Now there are three general outcomes of natural selection. Natural selection can um, happen where, so here, here's the variation, right? You've got dark to light in the, in the original population. If it turns out that it's better to be dark, have a dark colored suit, then over time, the, the more dark colored fur will be selected for and so you'll see a shift. That's called a directional selection. This is a really common type of natural selection. But you can also have diversifying selection where for whatever reason the really light and the really dark coat um, mice are the ones that are selected for and not the ones in the middle. If this happens un is strong enough and happens for long enough you can actually get two separate species that would evolve. And finally you can have stabilizing selection where the extremes are selected against and the middle ground is selected for. So the next mechanism is genetic drift. Genetic drift is a change in the gene pool, so a change in the, the way that the genes are distributed among a population, and this one is due completely to chance. So look at this example here. We've got these flowers that are growing. These letters here represent the um, allele for, for this gene of flower color. And if you have a big R, that is the gene for red. And if you have a little r, that's the gene for white. And the way that it works out is the big R is dominant to the little r. So if you ever have a big R and a little r together, it still is a red flower. You have to have two little r's to have a white flower. We'll learn, we'll learn more about that when we get to genetics. But the important thing here is if these flowers are all in a field, and let's say that a cow walks through here and happens to step on all of these flowers. Okay, so these are the only ones that survive to reproduce. Okay, so this, this has nothing to do with natural selection. It was just dumb luck chance that these ones got stepped on and these ones are okay. Well, if you look at and count up the number of big R's to the number of little R's, it's actually half and half. So where here we had 70% big R's and 30% little R's, now we have 50% big R's and 50% little R's. Now let's say that a flood comes through, I don't know, and the, only these two flowers survive. Okay, So dumb luck chance, these are the two that survive, everything else dies off. So these are the only two that reproduce. Notice they have all big R's. So now in the next generation, everything is going to be big R. right? And so now we have 100% big R. Now the, what you can see is the change in the gene pool, so a change in the proportion of the characteristics over time. That is also evolution, and this is why genetic drift is a form of evolution. Genetic drift has two types too. There's, there's the type of genetic drift called the bottleneck effect. So if you can imagine you have this big bottle here and you turn it over and you only let a few of them come out, the surviving population is very different from the original population, right? In fact, we've lost yellow and now there's m many more blues than there are whites. Another type of genetic drift is called founder effect. And this is where instead of only a few individuals from a large population surviving, what you do instead is you take a few individuals from the population and they go to a different area and found a new population. So, you know, the founding fathers came to the, the uh, you know, American continent. Or you can talk, think about this as people who go and found a little population on an island, right? And so, what, because you're taking a small sample from a larger sample, you end up with genetic drift that happens. And so random chance, you, you could get a different proportion of alleles, a different proportion of characteristics in the founding population than in the original population. A good example of this is in the um, Amish of Pennsylvania that came from Holland, and, and this small group of people started to reproduce, and they, and they only reproduced with themselves as well. And so 
pretty soon these characteristics that are very rare, like polydactyly, started to surface and in much higher proportions among the Amish of Pennsylvania than any other group of people all over the planet. The next mechanism is gene flow. Gene flow is simply the migration of one or more individuals from one population to another population of the same species. So there is genetic exchange. Now this tends to reduce the differences among or between populations, but it does tend to increase the genetic diversity within a population. So this one is green, but now it's going to get some brown, and so it's getting more variable. But the species as a total, um, it it didn't change that. It did change, though, um, between the populations. The fourth mechanism is mutation. Mutation is simply defined as any change in the organism's DNA. Now, alone, they don't have that, that big of an effect, but overall, they can have a huge effect. In fact, all differences, all genetic diversity came originally from mutation. And then there are some other mechanisms that lead to scrambling the, 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 those original differences up, but all variation initially began as a mutation. So, you know, over here is an example of the copy of a gene, which is called the messenger RNA, the mRNA, and these are the associated amino acids that are coded for from each of these three letters, and we'll learn more about this process late in a, in a different lecture. But if this G here changes to an A, instead of coding for glycine, it now codes for serine. That's called a base substitution mutation. Or sometimes nucleotides just get taken out. And so if you do that, then basically the, the rest of the, of the um, strand here slides over, and so you get what's called a frame shift. And now phenylalanine becomes leucine, and, and then now you have alanine, and you get this an enormous change in what the um, resulting protein is going to be because the underlying amino acids are all going to be different. And the last mechanism is non-random mating. Non-random mating is simply where um, one individual prefers to mate with a particular type of individual in the population. So many times this is an individual prefers to mate with someone that is much like itself. Sometimes we call this inbreeding. But it also could be that they prefer to mate with a particular type that is not like themselves. Random mating is where there is no preference. So this beetle would prefer to mate with any of these three. And those are the five mechanisms of evolution.